Happy Monday, everybody. Yo! Hello? We're going to start weird things here in just a minute. Yo! Oh my goodness, it's Monday. It's December 14, 2020. It's cold. Pretty cold. It's How cold? cold? How cold is cold for you guys? Uh, it was 46, right? Yeah, now. it was 36 this morning. Uh, Ooh. Cold, cold enough that I did not go jogging across the street to get breakfast. That is that is a chilly, chilly one. Yeah, yeah it'll it's probably been, get a it's little. It's been colder. dipping down, dipping down to the uh, low forties here. You get you guys morning. being coastal, it probably doesn't get below freezing very often, right? Oh, it has never gotten below freezing uh, in in the years I've lived in in Oakland. Hmm. Oh wow. We'll get we'll get freeze warnings here, you know, freeze alerts. Oh, sure. oh, it gets it gets cold out there. That's that that especially your your neck of the woods there, like uh, with that with that with that wind, that 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 breeze not being enjoyed by. That <laughs> I was cat. about to say, <laughs> no yeah. no cats are enjoying that breeze. <laughs> I wonder, is it me or is everybody moving to Texas? Oh my gosh, that's the hot news item. Boy, to be a property owner in Central Texas. I bet that's good news every morning. Yeah. yeah. I just keep, oh, Texas now. Texas is the answer. Texas. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I wonder where uh, where the upper limit is on that stuff in terms of. <laughs> it, t- it turns out like uh, uh, Right now, all the headlines are about moving to Texas, and then somewhere around June, July, all the headlines are, these millionaires are getting the fuck out of Texas. Sorry, I shouldn't have cursed. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Californians, heed advice. Go back to where they come from. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my goodness. Mm. All righty. Um, everybody, uh, everybody about ready to start the, th- the weird things? Let's ready, ready. Okay. Yep. Uh, you're good, Andrew. Yeah, you're. You're. I sent you all the notes because yeah. I wasn't sure I was going to make it. So yeah, I can. I can run. I can run stuff. No big deal. Oh, because it's so easy. I get it. <laughs> Anybody can do it. Okay. <laughs> of course not. Of course that's not what I mean. Uh, got... No, it is. Weird things just, is so easy. Me. Even a weird things host could run it. <laughs> <laughs> it's really just mumble through a couple topics and, and I'm done. <laughs> There's pre- there's prep work into this. All right, uh, all right. Here we go. Let's uh, let's start the show then. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the Weird Things Podcast. I'm Bryce Castillo, joined as always with Andrew Maine. Hello, Justin Robert Young. Yo, and Brian Brushwood. Howdy, howdy, howdy. Uh, this is just the way things normally are every week, and uh, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we got some news stop news new, some new topics of the weird. Uh, mm. uh, of course, we should probably start. We should get the SpaceX stuff up front, right? The uh, ooh, hot damn, man! Watching that live was a trip. That was an experience. I'm glad we did that. Wait, you guys watched it live? Just, yeah, it happened to be right was, in the middle of happy hour. It literally was was the the punctuation on happy hour. We, oh, nice. we just watched. Uh, yeah, the. Uh, and and we did not have the benefit of um, knowledge, so uh, everything looked very strange as it was happening. Uh, and and you know you you go back and realize like, oh wow, no, this was like picture perfect. That this this ran. This was such a, a successful uh, test. But in that moment, boy, does it. To untrained eyes look like a whale is falling from heaven and is about to <laughs> decimate uh, everything below it uh, before it, its miraculous 
recovery, and then it blows up just to be a show off. Yeah. So, so SpaceX it, tested the SN8 uh, a prototype of the Starship. Uh, it went up. It went up how high? About twelve kilometers or so. And twelve and a half. Twelve and a half kilometers. Uh, and uh, about six minutes into into its test flight, uh, it executed the. Is it called the whale procedure? Oh, I thought it was the belly flop. Belly, belly flop. flop. That's it. Belly flop. Uh, I guess as a means of having less of a heat shield necessary, I guess it can spread that heat over the long, the long side of the rocket. Uh, and uh, which that test seemed to go well. It moved fast. It ro- this thing rotates fast. Uh, and then at about six minutes or so, it uh, repositioned to land on the te- on the launch pad. And I guess there was not enough pressure in one of the tanks. It did not get enough lift. And it exploded in this crazy big fireball. I mean, it was it was a comical fireball of an explosion, especially over. Uh, and again, I think we got the superior experience by not knowing how things were supposed to go, because uh, there definitely looked to be interior parts that were catching fire on their way up and then engines shutting off. You're like, that can't be good. And then definitely it going sideways. If you if you didn't know that was on purpose, mm-hmm. uh, it's like, I think we're fine. Mm-hmm. And then just just at the end. I mean, obviously, uh, the tracking wise, it exactly landed. It 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 landed on it target. Exactly connected with the target, <laughs> just just uh, just a wee bit faster. Yeah. Uh, and I, I I know we discussed this before, but but the reason for that greenish hue uh, was that because there was like some copper somewhere in the engine. Is 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 that what it was? Yeah, at that point. So earlier on, when you saw the little bit of fire inside the, uh, I have my model here, by the way. Uh. Uh, when you see the little fire there, that's actually that's kind of a normal thing because that's actually some of the gas that sort of gets still is flamed and kind of will rotate around that chamber there. Um, when you get to the copper, it switched from burning fuel to burning rocket engine. <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> And so at that point, because it's super, super hot, and then it's, you know, what's happening there is at that point when it starts to give it a little less, it becomes more rocket rich than that. So uh, they saw that before, I think at one point, one of the test stands, they saw sort of the, the, the green. Some of view. that green. Yeah. I think that was the last time we had talked about it, but still uh, uh, really, really electric oh. and just just a marvelous, uh, extraordinary experience to watch. And there, there, there was kind of this this giddy video game quality because we all knew that almost certainly no human lives were endangered at all. Uh, we all knew that, you know, it'd be nice if it landed perfectly, but ain't nobody expected that right out of the gates. Uh, it was it was a blast, man. I really, really dug it. Even, even for myself, who I've been following this and waiting for this, we knew they were going to try to go to 12 and a half kilometers, that they were, the belly flop maneuver was something been talked about. I didn't know they were going to do this. And I think a lot of the people were the hardcore people were following this was, that was we thought perhaps we were just going to see a vertical takeoff and then the landing but when they did the belly flop the the goal of this is to make it for listeners is to make it kind of land like a kind of like decelerate kind of like a skydiver i think of it like a cat like you've heard the stories about like um below a certain number of floors a cat could fall off a building and be fine and above a certain number of floors it could be fine because you know it has enough time to rotate over and do that skydiver cat position and slow down well, yeah, but the the skydiver thing is be if you look at the, what the ailerons are doing, the flaps trying to adjust it, and that that sort of the idea of how do you you know the idea of the deceleration is based on sort of imagine somebody in sort of a wingsuit, and yeah. so it's already balanced. It's not trying to land, and it's already balanced there. But the idea is to slow down, and they use Tesla motors to actually control the flaps. If you look at them closely, you see them adjusting and moving back and forth, trying to keep them you know totally stable. And so the belly flop maneuver, the idea is if it's coming in from, let's say, from Earth to Mars, you to slow down all the speed that it took to get to Mars, you have to shed off all that energy very quickly in the atmosphere. And one way is you have engines and you have a way more fuel and halfway towards Mars or closer, or whatever, you just blast your engines to slow down, but that requires more fuel. The other way is to get rid of all that energy in the atmosphere, but that means heat shields and slowing down so here the idea is like use the heat shields to come in really fast it's heat shielded and then put the largest surface you can kind of like the shuttle but the shuttle was a glider this thing is literally just falling just straight for the most down part. just yeah. falling yeah, yeah. It, it is an insane visual it was magnificent to watch and then as it corrects it, it it's just something where you need to really remind yourself to appreciate that 
this structure <laughs> is taller than the tallest building in like most American towns. Like this is 160 four, feet this tall. Is, this is a massive, massive uh, uh, feat of engineering. And it turns that it can so just so quick, effortlessly, yeah. yeah, correct itself from fully horizontal to fully vertical. I was watching this, looking at how fast it rotated from, you know, the its ascension uh, direction to the belly flop and then from the belly flop to the landing angle. And it it seemed so fast. It seemed way too fast for, hu like, if humans are going to be on board this thing. <laughs> Uh, oh, that's an interesting thing. I, I hadn't even really considered how pleasant it would be on to, <laughs> to, to, to be in there. <laughs> I'm sure they they probably must take that into account. Oh, my gosh. To realize, like, part of your transatlantic flight would involve, and then we'll fall sideways for about 10 minutes. <laughs> and then, don't worry, we'll scoopsy doodle at the end, and you'll be fine, I'm sure. <laughs> Finally, all those not? years on the Gravitron at the holiday uh, winter uh, <laughs> carnival, <laughs> yeah, will we'll pay off. Scrambled eggs. If it if it means no airport connections, done. Yeah. Done. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Put me in a metal drum, bang on it. Don't care. So uh, they already have um, SS or excuse me, S not SN nine serial number nine. The next rocket just about done. Um, what? I'm... There was a little whoopsie doozy. Oh, was there? Yeah, SN9, which is the next one. So they're building, they have the the next, you know, the next series of rockets ready to go. So like, ah, this one blow up. It's like Elon's like, we got more. But SN9 was inside its hangar and it was on its engine mount, and it decided to lean and it fell <gasps> against the side, and they had to bring in a crane to pull it up. And it's a little dented. We don't know yet how much damage there is to SN9. The plan was to put that on the pad this week. Oh, no. <laughs> it should not lean against go, the wall. Go home, SN9. You had too much. Yeah. He's like, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I don't want to blow up. I don't want to it's, it's like, I just saw what happened to my brother. Give me a moment. Leaning against the wall. Like, yeah. There's a photo. Elon's just talking to it. No, you're going to be all right. It's, it's going to be okay. It's fine. <laughs> so. Wow. Uh, oh, my gosh. So uh, that's a little bit of, a little bit of SpaceX news. Uh, you also probably saw this in the news. Uh, uh, you guys remember? You guys remember that Zodiac killer? <laughs> I've heard a thing oh, or two about yeah, him. Oh yeah, this this <laughs> this what, guy. What episode did we have him on? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, it looks like after however many d decades, the uh, Zodiac three forty cipher has been cracked, uh, and now people have solved the message of the Zodiac killer's uh, letter. What made it so hard to to do uh, or or to decrypt uh, to begin with? I mean, I, I guess as I'm saying this, I'm thinking back to whatever I've learned about ciphers. And for example, if it's a book cipher or whatever, really it's unbreakable unless you have the book. Um, was was it something like that, or was it just clever in a way that nobody had, was able to figure out? I guess also there's a level of effort put in because like if you don't care, then then it doesn't get solved. <laughs> Um, y you know, I, uh, I, I don't know. I wonder if it's because there are a few misspellings on here that, that make me think that that's like paradise is P A R A D I C E in, in the couple of times it shows up. So I wonder if, um, if that's it, that there was actually, uh, inaccuracies in the original, uh, the original, uh, unencrypted message. Uh, there's uh, a whole, uh, video, uh, that that's been put out, I think. I think partly this is partly solved by amateur uh, uh, code crackers. Yeah, I, I, I believe it was a group of three folks just working together online uh, that that cracked this code. And, and apparently there have been other folks who have said that they've done it, have claimed that they've cracked it. But, but make, what makes this notable is this is the first time that the FBI has chimed in and said, yes, we believe that this indeed is a cracking of the code, which almost makes you wonder whether or not they had crack the code or or you know we're you know leaning toward uh some reason why they are they are deciding to bless this version of it yeah um but i thought that was a an interesting thing to to point out is that after you know o over 50 years uh we finally got him we got uh, him everybody can i can i well, just I mean, be we the one to fall him. on this we on this him. sword and say like i i have no idea what makes the zodiac killer famous or or why i know that name 
So uh, if anyone well, would like to enlighten yeah, me. All right. So serial killer <laughs> out here in the uh, uh, Pacific Northwest, um, I think the Bay Area and uh, I don't know if he was anywhere else, but uh, yeah, he would like uh, send these uh, letters to local media and brag about the killings that he was doing and uh, uh, famously was never caught. So uh, still... I mean, if he's alive out there somewhere. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, as someone is pointing out in, in the chat that he sent out a lot of letters that use different code. So this is not uh, uh, not necessarily the solution to all of his messages, but uh, uh, but just one of them. So uh, there's a little bit of that. We got him. We got him, folks. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> and, 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 uh, did, did you read the whole message? Is there is there a TLDR? That he put at the He's end. He's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing with this guy. You know, uh, uh, he's he's a serial killer, and he's you know trying to harass local media and terrorize the public. So it just says, "I hope you're having lots of fun trying to catch me." That wasn't me on the TV show, which brings up a point about me. I am not afraid of the gas chamber because it will send me to paradise all the sooner because I now have enough slaves to work for me where everyone else has nothing when they reach paradise. So they are afraid of death. I am not afraid because I know that my new life is life will be an easy one in paradise death. This is a multi-level marketing scheme. <laughs> Dude's <laughs> like, he's talking about his upstream income and how, you know, he's. Yeah. Boo. So here's a question. Let's, let's do a little serial killer logic right now. Uh, apparently, uh, you know, he thinks that for everybody he murdered, they get, they're going to be a slave in the afterlife, which really one of the worst possible person to have as a slave. One is to have a person <laughs> as a slave. Let's make that clear. Yeah. Probably a person you murdered. <laughs> yeah. Get ready for an eternity of like, oh, would you give me a diet, Dr. Pepper? <sighs> yeah. And, and, and like. I, in his logic, like whoever like kills the most people gets the most slaves in heaven, which um, mm. doesn't sound like heaven. <laughs> Sounds like the other but place. It, it's it's and I'm serial like, killer heaven. Does does Hitler get credit for? <laughs> yeah. Like, how does this Stalin? Like Mao? I mean, who's really got the most slaves in heaven now? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm trying real hard not to make this into a night attack bit. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, 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 changing topics here just a little bit. <laughs> Fine, I'll just <laughs> yeah. leave that to me to wonder, Bryce. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I, 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 I do think that there is like obviously a lingering fascination with this case. Uh, serial killer logic, or our fascination with serial killers has uh, exploded over the last. 20 years like like in 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 a way that is uh uh kind of like uncommon with, with you see how big true crime podcasts are how uh, you know true crime a documentary series there is just something about peering into the mind of somebody that would do something so horrifying that we as humans just for whatever reason find endlessly fascinating but uh uh i don't know i'm 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 i i i, I tend to be uh, a little bit more on the side of like, well, yes, congratulations. We we have finally brought the focus in on this picture and we can now uh, see it in stark, sharp relief. And he's crazy. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Right. Look at this crazy man doing crazy man just, things. Just a pro tip out there. No matter how popular serial killers and murder shows and all that are, and particularly I noticed like, like my girlfriend watches them all the time, which has me concerned. Um, for guys out there, don't put your really into serial killers and murder stories into your bio if you're like trying to do <laughs> online dating. Just, just some advice. Just put mysteries. You don't need to put them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, a little bit of a, ch a topic change here, uh, gentlemen. Just pat yourselves on the back. We found him. Oh, thank goodness. We found him. Wow. All right. Cool. Uh, uh, in Scott's so wait, so so we already got the the Zodiac killer. Now we found somebody else. We found fa found someone else. That's right. Uh, out, out in Scotts Valley, California, uh, police responded to a suspicious figure in the roadway, and they found Bigfoot. Oh, of course. Everybody, good job. We did it. It's me, Bigfoot. And twenty twenty. Twenty twenty. Uh, in fact, they got a photo of it. Would you like to see the photo of Bigfoot? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, I suppose. I'm, I'm, yeah, why don't you go ahead and bring me the Bigfoot picture? Oh, I Mr. Newsy McNews is skeptical here. Uh, I am. I am. <laughs> I right. am a little, I'm a little skeptical. I want to get eyes on that. I want to see if it's legit. And I'll just say, you can know that this is true because you can see the police car in the photo. This is from, uh, uh, from WCYS. <laughs> it would be. Mm. Is this definitely looks to be about a five foot, uh, maybe four and a half, five foot tall chainsaw art. Uh, <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah. So this is, uh, a statue of Bigfoot from the Bigfoot Discovery Museum in Scotts Valley. Uh, Scotts Valley in Northern California. California? Uh, I, I God, I wonder so. if I drove past that. I, I, it's uh, 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 I remember there was some kind of Bigfoot museum when we went to Eureka, California. We drove from uh, San Francisco on up. Uh, uh, this is that'd be fun. This is just so south this of is, San yeah, this Jose. Is between yeah, San okay. Jose and Santa Cruz. Okay, so a different one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, yeah, no authorities found the four foot tall wooden statue after it had been stolen from the museum on Monday. Uh, and yeah, there we go. Look at that. That so, is a very funny version of Bigfoot. He just looks like he is like built like a beer keg, <laughs> uh, a very like as tall as he is wide, uh, a version, but that's a great, I mean, he, like I, I would, I would put that in my, in my foyer. His, his, uh, his posture is, it looks like he's in high school and the local cut down artist is having at him and he's stoically just putting up with it until he could go to study hall. And he's, he's had a fruit roll up within the last hour. <laughs> oh, with, without a doubt, without a doubt, this man loves fruit roll ups. Uh, where do you think this was in the Bigfoot museum? Is it up front? Is it like in the back? Is it like the uh, prize possession? Where do you think? Uh, let's if see. If they could, if they, if it was able to be stolen, and I believe the museum is closed because of COVID right now, my guess would be outside. outside. Thanks, Governor Newsom. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not gonna throw any aspersions over here, but I remember in Florida, whenever there'd be a, a swamp, a, a, a swamp ape or swamp squatch, as I tried to call them. Whenever there would be some story about him, a skunk ape, whenever we'd have a skunk ape story or something like this or some of these other Bigfoot things, almost always the person on the news talking about, oh, something went missing or something was sighted here was the person who owned the local museum. Oh, got it. Somebody who understands like, uh, uh, sure, I could spend $200 on an ad. Or I could just pick up the phone and oh, say something got stolen. If I had two hundred dollars in my cash <laughs> right. register here, wow. but I run a Bigfoot museum and I don't because people forgot about Bigfoot. And it is, I mean, they found it on the side of the road, not messed up, not graffitied, not wearing a party hat or a... So wait, oh wait, do you think that when all the Bigfoot museum operators get together for the national convention, like down at the Marriott bar, this Foot is con. the kind of like the hot uh, 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 strats that they're trading late into the night. I don't accuse that. I think this sounds like a genuine somebody pulled up and popped this thing in the back of the car sure. or whatever. Yeah. But in other cases, that's been like there was one of these things. I remember the skunk ape. You keep hearing about like, oh, this ex skunk ape expert. You find out he runs the little local skunk ape museum, and he'd be telling like, mm. oh yeah, I've seen him a lot. He's real, <laughs> you know, and. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know what? I think you've, you're tapping into a bigger conspiracy. Uh, uh, <laughs> all the, these news headlines about, you know, finding the God particle at the Large Hadron Collider, kind of suspicious that it comes straight out of the source. Uh, how are their tours these days? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Where do they get their... Oh, well, tax. Yeah. <laughs> but that's not the point. Um, there is that... That was, remember, the weeping statues? Oh, yeah. That was like in the 90s. It was like statues started weeping left and right. And like, wow, this is really wow, a lot of a lot of weeping statues. The, and when the, they start the weeping, was, attendance I, goes up. If I remember correctly, like the most charitable interpretation of the weeping statue would be uh, during certain levels of humidity with temperature changes, uh, cold stone, warm, humid temperatures, you would get condensation that would uh, capillary action would draw it to the creases and folds around the eyes and the nose. And so you, you had well-intentioned um, people kind of, you know, who never paused to look and, you know, you don't wake up every morning and say, I wonder if my statue is weeping today. And then you go check. And then all of a sudden, a lot of people did. So, so possibly some number of them were 
attention focusing, but uh, but I would imagine there was no shortage of people just you know, well, if he ain't crying, he's gonna be <laughs> like, let's make him cry. Yeah. <laughs> It was when one started weeping glycerin. That was when it, because you know what? Yeah. Glycerin takes longer to roll down and this, and that was oh. that was when that started happening. Yeah. Oh, crazy. Ooh. The other analogy, too, which is thing to bring up was there was the rash of remember church burnings. And uh, I look don't up remember the, the FBI, was, that was the 90s, whatever, yeah. early aughts, whatever. It was, it, um, it, it was one of those, it was one of those cases where. Uh, folks had to really consider whether or not they wanted to do articles about them for fear of making other people think like, well, there's an idea. I can get attention by burning down a church. Oh, huh. Well, a number of them were actually, some of them were done by the people running the churches because you had these much smaller churches. There are like genuine cases of horrific arson, people doing this, this, but there are several cases where it turned out that people running these very small churches set the church on fire, insurance, et cetera, whatever. And that kind of story kind of went, fell out of the news once they realized a number of these were done by the operators of the church. Ugh. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's stuff like that. Like you, you see that a lot in like a, a smaller stake stuff, like restaurant ownership and everything. Like the idea of people, uh, you know, for, for many different reasons, you know, financial, emotional, and otherwise, uh, realizing that there's a benefit to a big change or ending to something. Mm. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Um, speaking of a big, yeah. big change, uh, 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 you all have have given us a significantly very big change. Mm. Mm, you, you've talk. given us your loose change. <laughs> oh god. Yes. Here's a conspiracy the theory. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's a conspiracy for us to say our theories over at patreoncom slash weird things. That's right. Uh, uh, every everybody who supports us helps make sure that this show happens every week, uh, loud and live and independent. And if you subscribe, you can get. Uh, uh, our our sister show After Things, where we talk about being a creative professional uh, earlier than anybody else in your own RSS feed, and there's no login required. It's just it's just for you, and it's super super simple. patreoncom slash weird things. Got a your uh, support. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, got a got a hypothetical for you all. Let's let's imagine. All right, everybody. Let's, let's imagine. Let's say. 2,000 years into the future. Mm. Man okay. man has broken through so the... That's what? The year 5,000? Yeah. <laughs> uh, man has broken through the space ceiling, right? And we are okay. now an intergalactic species. Breaking uh, the space ceiling in, is in, a great in, phrase. In two, 200 minutes. That's right. Yeah. And okay. uh, we, we've developed... We realize, hey, you know, we need to keep all these planets together we can have some sort of semblance of a of a galactic say federation got it got it so mm -hmm. so uh we, we we punch through the space ceiling and, and yeah. it's and it's like all the planets they're running around like teenagers at a high school dance and you're like doggone it we need we need all y'all to to stay on the straight and narrow and by straight and narrow i mean round or elliptical orbits <laughs> that's right and what would what would the procedure be what do you think just uh, broadly hypothetical Hi, hypo, hi, hypothesizing here uh if you wanted to add a planet into that federation maybe a planet that hasn't yet broken through the that space ceiling yet but we but you are aware of it what would what would you do what would it look like to both living on and say off the planet how would you do that how would you make say first contact basically first contact yeah, this this is this is the prime directive from from star trek uh, uh it's a series bryce you should check it out <laughs> Um, <laughs> but I, would you would you want the prime directive? Would you handle no? Oh, Andrew says no. Oh, this is. I, I mean, I, I say, yeah, step aside. On. Talk, I'm, I'm, talk yeah, about I'm, the I'm high school say. dance. You better clear the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is why I hated the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still and some of the aspects of the Prime Directive. Day the Earth Stood Still as aliens come and they're like, "Hey, we judge you unworthy, and we're going to destroy you," which is like. Wait, you think we're self-destructive and your punishment is to destroy us? <laughs> Logical problem there. Two, in that movie came out, you know, uh, even like when the Prime Detective came out, you had a billion people living in communist China who did not have a lot of choice in who their leaders were. 
other peoples in poor countries, people in you know continents and places like Africa, South America, whatever. Wonderful, awesome people, victims of you know political environments that were made it difficult, you know, for people to sort of have their way or to have democracy or express themselves. And even still, and that's the thing I'm always like, we judge you by the tyrants running you. And we understand mm -hmm. you don't always have the capability to overthrow them because that would involve violence. I've always had that problem with the idea of like, like, do we, do we really want, you know, the people who showed up at the G8 summit to be who we're judged by? If I was an intelligent alien species and I came to judge Earth, you know, Earth, am I, is that who I'm going to go is like, you know, uh, who are the people, you know, hanging out in Aspen? That's the representative of the rest of the people. Hmm. That always frustrated me. And like, you know, half the population is like under the age of like 18 or, you know, it's like young. And it's like, so I'm not a the, fan of that. The, the, there's also, I mean, as, if, if we're just all going to hold on, let me, let me, let me get <laughs> ready here. <clears throat> if we're all just going to yeah, start, let me pull out the you got this, Brian, you got this. Go, go, like, yeah, <laughs> go, get it, get uh, it. No, 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 like, like, it's not even a hypothetical question. There are actual island cultures and, and um, uh, there are people with good intentions who feel like, well, this culture, we shouldn't bother them with, you know, our vaccines and our, you know, uh, machines and our wheels and stuff. And so uh, there are, for example, in um, uh, 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 Hawaii, one of the islands is uh, like, oh, it's so valuable to protect its culture or whatever. Nobody's allowed to develop there. Nobody's allowed to do nothing. You have to be born into it or whatever. And their biggest problem is that they're vanishing because all the teenagers uh, say like, wait, so there's a kick-ass, awesome world out there and you want me to stay here because because it feels, uh, because it makes them happier to, 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 to think of us as we don't have medicines and foods and cell phones and all that stuff. Mm. Eh, I'm going to peace out. Uh, and, and given the opportunity, turns out they want to join the, the real world. And of course, we're seeing that uh, also in rural communities that are, that are vanishing as more people, um, uh, however bad you think, and this is, you know, an old economic argument that we certainly shouldn't adjudicate here, but, but the justification, like as bad as a sweatshop may look, it's oftentimes, even in the 1800s, populated with people who liked that better than subsistence farming, a.k.a. extreme poverty. Uh, and so it's like uh, if if they are sentient beings, then they deserve to make their own choice. That's what it means to be sentient. And that involves, yeah, I, you know, letting them off that rock if that's what they want. You know, a, a way to substitute is like cult. <laughs> if somebody's raised in a cult you know, in the middle of, you know, Utah somewhere, you know, the girl's raised up there and she's told and she's old enough. They're going to tell her who she has to marry. Do we think that's cool? And we'd be like, well, that's different. Different. Why? Because of the county she was born in. Right. Or, 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 that, that's or because of the novelty of the cult. It's like, no, you don't understand. Yeah. There used to be thousands of these cults. Now we're only down to only three. We have to, after that, they'll be gone forever. Good. Let them all be gone. Let Man, everybody make what, the free way, choices. The, the, way, the, 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 the way that you guys are talking about cults uh, makes it uh, draw some striking parallels to my continued viewing of The Crown on Netflix. Oh, jeez. <laughs> we, are, we are getting I, – I never even thought of that, but that, uh, that, that, that's a hot well, take to beat the band. I think that comes down to think we want a choice. And I think that yeah. I, I think that we have a lot of uh, – there are a lot of fascinating communities and ways of life that are vanishing. And as did, you know, our, our Celtic ancestors and our Germanic tribes did. But if there are people who want to maintain that and continue that lifestyle, that's fine. Just don't make your kids the victims of this. Mm. And, and also helping people move from one thing to another is hard. That's one of the problems, too, is like, you know, the history is replete with people who live on the fringes and continue to be victimized. And that's an important thing to think about. But I, I like choice. Everybody else here likes choice. So, you know. Mm. Okay, so let's let's go back to the hypothetical, right? We've we've okay, right. we've set up a galactic federation, and yeah. let's say that there's a planet that uh, we would like to bring into the federation, right? And yeah. they've they've made the decision to join. We've decided we've and and to to be clear, this is an awesome federation. Uh, we it's have great. a slogan: "The sun's never set on the intergalactic federation." Yeah, that's right. Not in not in ten billion years will that's they ever right. set. Uh, no, it's a, it's a, let's say it's, I mean, it's our federation. Like we made a good one. Let's just yeah. say we made no, a good Joel, one. We only have the right sentient beings. <laughs> Wink. 
<laughs> in our federation. <laughs> I like I like that you went from we made it and we made a good one. <laughs> a little bit of a leap there. <laughs> I'm picking up what you're putting down. I, I see what kind yeah. of federation we are. But but this is a civilization that, you know, is either not started intergalactic travel or uh, is only say flirting with it or they haven't gotten there. They certainly don't believe in extraterrestrial life. You mean a culture, oh, right, not right, the wrong right. guy. You mean a planet. Yeah, hold yes, on, a planet. Hold yeah. on. Uh, I don't want to be the nudge in the room here, but uh, uh, speaking on behalf of the Galactic Federation, it's in it for us. I mean, what do they got? Some rocks we want? Like, you know, <laughs> is, like, we got uh, I'm something gonna need unobtainable, a little, some kind of special I'm mineral. We need a little give back here before we start going in there and mixing it up with the locals. I mean, I expect like most federations, it would be taxes, but. Uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, taxes with what? What are what are they even doing? They don't even know about. Uh, hey, they haven't broken their space ceiling. We'd be coming in like sure. we would be like. Uh, uh, we'd Ethan be like Hunt. We, yeah, we would install we, a space sunroof on their behalf. Yeah. Uh, that ain't cheap, man. Hell Look, no. here's what we do. I got Let's go things ahead. to do on a Saturday. Let's install the space moon roof. Uh, yeah. uh, no up ch- uh, upfront charges. Mm-hmm. We come on in. We say you're welcome. They could pay it off in the long term. Yeah, yeah. you know, twenty percent of their GDP or sure. whatever they got. Yeah, uh, Rick yeah, and Morty well, Mandalorian yeah. episodes. Those are our currencies. <laughs> that's it. I'm just saying, you know, gather up them rocks. I want to take a look at them when we get down there. Like we got to figure this out. So, I mean, unless the people themselves are super valuable. In which case, you know. Yeah. By the way, are they made of rocks? Let's write that down on questions to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so l- let's let let's just say how how do you get from logistically? How do you get from uh, you know approaching a planet and deeming it worthy but not ready to uh, to say telling the people of that planet? Or how do you meet with <laughs> leadership? Like what are Andrew knows what I'm trying to get us to here, yeah. but uh, uh, you know what? Because ha- you can't. Are you just gonna roll up with the whole fleet and say, "All right, I'm just like, all right, guys, no wrong answers in a brainstorm, right?" But I'm just gonna start the conversation mm. at a little song and dance routine, like just we just roll up and we all kind of know a little bit, and it starts with like one or two people <laughs> pan out. Now it's like four or five. Eventually, a big, maybe like Bollywood style dance number, and that's how we sort of make our make our presence known. Oh, see, I, I was figuring do... like a four, maybe five person breakdance troupe, and then we just come down and then just blow I don't their think, minds. I don't, I don't think that we're mutually exclusive here. Let's weave it in. Let's okay. weave it in. What, I, I, I have an alt approach. It's like they like hire a marketing agency, and like first we're gonna put a little monument in Utah. Then we're going to put out some Instagram ads. Hold on. Here's what we do. We start with a focus group, so we collect (laughs) just a few of them, and let's get real salt-of-the-earth aliens, too. Like, maybe from their equivalent of trailer parks or, you know, on lonely highways. Brian, And we're not going to keep them forever. We're just going to take them long enough to, you know, kind of take their temperatures, so to speak, in the most effective way. you got to measure their body responses. Yeah, right? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, like maybe keep squirm. a sample or two, and then when then we'll put them back, maybe with a little tracker in there, just like we do to all the kind animals on our own planet. Treat exactly. them They'll like one of our own. They'll never know it's different. It's common yeah. courtesy. So this uh, this hypothetical is not so hypothetical. If what? You, if you ask Professor what? Haim Eshed, a former general uh, with uh, the uh, uh, is Israeli Space Agency. To, uh, uh, I don't exactly know. He's a he's a, he's a former yeah, Israeli general. Let's go with that. Yeah. Uh, he believes that uh, uh, United States President Donald Trump has been on the verge of disclosing the existence of aliens to the world, and a galactic federation has been pressuring him not to. Um. It, it, <clears throat> okay. What? Are, uh, if it was true, wouldn't they? I mean, maybe they just don't want his administration to be the one <laughs> to introduce them. Well, no, no, N- no. no. Pfizer saying, aliens yeah, don't want him yeah, to have it before the election. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I kind of feel like this one would probably would have made it into a tweet by now. Mm. I, I, I Not the famously reserved 
uh, a 45th president of the United States, always making sure that he can perfectly craft and hone his messaging. I mean, there, there's a, there's a name around DC. They call him old secret keeper, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh that's, but, but Fort even Knox. that, that name is a secret because that's how good I, at secrets he is. I, I want you to imagine whatever administration you want that you're called in each one of you, you're called in by, you know, let's, let's say, you know, next president, president Biden, whoever, and say, Hey, I need you. Holy crap. Aliens are real. You got to write a tweet. I need you to write a tweet for this. I can't yeah. think of what to write. Write a tweet. Hmm. I mean, like, it's entirely possible that there are other species here on Earth that are sentient, uh, at least as sentient as some people. And even that, I wouldn't even know how to write that tweet. <laughs> I don't know how to convince us that those creatures exist. Well, I mean, you would think that if this is coming from the head of the federal government, the executive branch of the federal government, it's something that is important enough for all Americans to be affected by it. If we are discussing the concept of a galactic federation, for which the next logical question would be, are we joining a galactic federation? Uh, then, then yeah, you got to, that, that is a politically sensitive issue because I mean, hell, I don't know if you've uh, picked up on this, but the idea of, of joining extra national multi-government <laughs> systems is a bit of a controversial one these <laughs> days. I, I can't imagine. I mean, like uh, uh, what would, what would the question be? Like, like, you know, is, is this maybe, yeah, all right, here's a situation. I could totally get Trump not wanting to say it because he's still trying to figure out what the deal is. <laughs> like, we will not join the Galactic <laughs> Federation until we get our fair share. The art of the space deal. Of, of, yeah. of what? Real estate, of course. <laughs> Intergalactic <laughs> real estate and only yeah. the best. He's like, you know, just a very pensive Donald Trump on the phone, on, on whatever space phone that they give him. And he's just like, show me the rocks. What kind of rocks you got? We're going to get the best rocks out of this deal. We're going to get the best rocks out of this. <laughs> uh, pro Professor Ashed uh, said, if I had come up with what I'm saying today five years ago, I would have been hospitalized. Uh, but he believes that he has built up the academic reputation to back up his claims of this federation and aliens i mean that's the equivalent of saying that that over the last five years i've been microdosing iocane powder and have said enough tiny crazy things that i can now say this completely crazy thing without worries yeah he is 83 yeah yeah but he was he was i, I we did he was the he ran uh mm. the uh israel national space security program for 30 years yeah yeah. I mean, that's only five years younger than Biden. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, uh, we got time for one last super quick story. Hell yeah. S sure. Super quick. Yeah. Um, uh, mammoths. What do you know about mammoths? Uh, I know that, uh, that, that I can't shake the idea of bringing them back uh, because they're, they're only kind of recently extinct and the DNA is intact enough. Then there's some talk about like, yeah, you know, you could probably germinate something close to a mammoth inside inside of uh, some elephants, and then just keep on growing from there. I, bring them back. That's what I say. But we're gonna have to cool down this planet, or 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 seed the North Pole to them. Mm. We could give them the North Pole. I think. I feel like <laughs> suckers. It's gonna melt. <laughs> <laughs> they should have asked for the South Pole. So, uh, uh, scientists and archaeologists in northern Siberia uh, have found remains of mammoths and they believe that early humans had butchered the mammoths mm. uh yeah. so, 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 so you mean not just killed it and just started grabbing meat and wolfing it down but but actually like you know oh this is the good cut and the bad cut but uh, yeah but actually intentionally uh uh you know, cut into cut into the carcass. <laughs> they, uh, they. I'll have some ribeye, please. <laughs> yeah, all I can think of is just hipster cavemen. You know, with like, like, ah, like I, I, you know, had they have their handlebar mustache and like a, a fresh mammoth cut, like only the finest organic for for you, Ugg. 
<laughs> so I, yeah, what's up? I wonder how good. It, I mean, like we ate a lot of mammoth. Apparently, like was it like the most delicious, awesome thing? I I would imagine it would be pretty close to buffalo, and I've had uh, uh, what bison. That's kind of close to buffalo, uh, but that's me making up an awful lot of steps there. Mm. They they do mention here that mammoth brain. Uh, the the brain of a mammoth was was pretty regularly uh, uh, consumed uh, by by uh, by these early humans. So uh, they they believe that that the humans had been uh, butchering them because they found scratches on some of these new skeletons that were uh, parallel that that looked like uh, they were cutting with the meat grain that that they okay. were cutting intentionally, not randomly because of you know geographic pressures and and you know. Claws. dissolution over the years um i'm reading i'm reading um how does elephant taste how does it taste yeah it's an equivalency but like some it's like there's a lot of like no it doesn't taste very good um which you wonder like one it might be like some of the big large african animals maybe that's genetically sort of adapted to not taste good but also is it propaganda i mean big I elephant. Hold, on, like hold, a, on, hold on hold on hold on hold on this we we have we have some some relatively breaking news. There is a man who, in two thousand and one, a Siberian zoologist says that he ate mammoth meat. <gasps> oh man! Uh, oh, that's apparently uh, uh, th- that it was the meat was so frozen that I guess he like reheated it. <laughs> he didn't cook it. Uh, but no, he's. Well, I guess so. Yeah. Uh, uh, he says that he ate it. It tasted awful and smelled rotten. Uh, well, uh, he was <laughs> eating thirty thirty thousand year old meat. I mean, uh, sometimes it, it's aged to perfection. <laughs> uh, so on on Friday, our modern rogue episode was us eating a twenty five year old MRE, and of course, all the comments are like, "Big whoop, so and so ate." 50 year old mre or whatever like just give me that article so that can become my default response to everyone like big wolf this dude in siberia ate a thirty thousand year old mre yeah, what yeah what we I, I, I have a description here from uh this was a uh, a member of the shoot borsak member of the shooters fishers farmers party who went on an elephant hunt in africa and he had a lot of critics of him and he did in fact eat the elephant he killed he said yes i did but as it wasn't in one sitting. <laughs> like, no, let me tell you how I did it. One bite at a time. One bite at a time. <laughs> Here's his how, do you, how do you get to Carnegie Hall? <laughs> he, he writes, it, it tastes like venison. Do you, there are parts of the head and neck which we sliced and fried with a bit of butter. It's very tasty. I believe this guy. Oh, my goodness. So, um, yeah, so so there's still more uh, to be researched on on these. In fact, the 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 mammoth that they had found uh, in Siberia was not even the one that the scientists had gone up there to study, um, but because of uh, a global warming, I believe the one that they meant to go look at was was not available. Oh, so it was like surplus. It was like finding an extra half-eaten sandwich on your way to the mac and cheese that you know is back there somewhere. <laughs> You're like, well, this is extra. I'll just go ahead and have a nibble. Apparently, they just talked to someone up there. He's like, oh, I got, I know another mammoth over here if you want to go. <laughs> <laughs> so a little That's bit hilarious. of hilarious mammoth update. Don't uh, eat elephants, anybody. Don't eat them. They're beautiful, amazing, intelligent creatures. Don't eat them. Yeah. Yeah. Unless, have, unless it's it old like. and no longer able to uh, uh, to uh, 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 not replicate. What do you call it? Uh, reproduce uh, and and is, yeah. and is chasing off other. <laughs> yeah. You, know, you know what? Then in that case, or or lab grown elephant meat, or sure, or or if or it, it looks doesn't at you have funny. those, if it doesn't have those precious rocks, you want. <laughs> <laughs> uh, also, don't let them into the Galactic Federation. No, we gotta Federation. be careful. I'm not going to name names, but remember we talked once about eating whale and one of us got sent whale meat? <gasps> no, I don't remember that. I, I don't remember. One I remember us, a one prank. Of us, one of us got, uh, yeah, uh, allegedly, <laughs> uh, according allegedly. to local legend, uh, one of us got sent whale meat and then one of us <laughs> tweeted it and then one of us got a panicked phone call from another person on this podcast saying that what one person had just tweeted was essentially posting two pounds of weed on <laughs> on Twitter because this was highly illegal. 
<laughs> and I, I, so, so whoever, what, what, somebody, really? whoever, whoever posted somebody that should was not very, should be deleting that. Yeah, uh, and also, not be talking publicly about it. Whoever, whoever that person was, covered their tracks very well by tweeting. LOL, I can't believe you fell for that. That was fake. <laughs> Which I, I think just smoothed everything over. Yeah. Move along, coppers. <laughs> and they just like started twirling their batons. Whoa, okay, now, nothing to see here. It's just a funny little prank. Tight, 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 tight. Uh, and it tasted terrible. Uh, all right, well, uh, that's it for news topics. You guys want to do some picks? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 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 I, I, I don't want to go too far into it, but uh, I finally started watching um, uh, Kim's Convenience. I'm about six Ooh, episodes into it. Yeah. Freaking great. It's, it's so great. Um, and it's fun that the first four seasons are already on Netflix because it's around for six seasons in, uh, in Canada. And uh, I love that the main character is one of the space cops in an X-Wing from uh, Mandalorian. And um, which, uh, no, hearing him speak... Uh, uh, plain perfect english uh uh I, I i part of what makes the show adorable is the broken korean uh accented english in which uh, so many of the characters speak and knowing that it is a affectation that i assume they have a style bible for or whatever makes me very confused about whether i should be okay with giggling at it but it's adorable <laughs> and i love it and uh please nobody take it away from me it's very cute my uh uh my dad my fa- my parents love that show it's, i i it, showed it to them last year or the year before and they it's it's so easy to watch it's really fun well and there's so many characters to latch on to it's like at various times i i get to be the 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 young son i, I get to be the dad I, I even get to be the daughter and the mom at various times uh love it love it love it love it yeah can i just say one of the wonderful things i think that like netflix has brought to us was traditionally hollywood casting tended to be a little bit uh by the numbers <laughs> yeah a little bit too uh sorry you don't fit our ideal of what we think our audiences want to watch you know people look like us yeah. um yeah and then netflix has hey we got these shows you know from well, other shows from around the world too of different culture shows and things like this and all of a sudden it's like no nah, people like people people like interesting people doing interesting people things and it's such a neat thing to finally sort of make hollywood kind of go like yeah, no. Uh, shows can be very different. You it's, know, have different kinds of people, different stuff. It's there's, wonderful. There's definitely like in the second or third episode a two minute vignette in which this Canadian show is portraying a Korean store owner as objectively racist <laughs> against the Japanese, yeah. and it's adorable. <laughs> and it just makes me it makes me think about you know things that 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 are white hot race uh, based uh, buttons here in America, like. How does that look from the other side of the planet? Like, 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 is it, is, is, do they find it adorable the way I find the racism against the Japanese adorable in this sitcom? It's like, uh, I don't know. It's crazy. Uh, don't eat well meat. Um, don't eat uh, elephant. Racism bad. <laughs> yep. Okay, good. Okay. Good. <laughs> uh, Andrew, have you got a pick? Uh, let me think about it for a second there. Ooh. Um, oh, what's oh. happening? Uh, sorry, I just got to get this ring fit workout in before I do my pick here. Yeah. Um, what is that? That's the ring fit, the what? ring fit adventure. Ah. The thing Bryce has been talking about for like ever. <laughs> yeah, I've never seen it. So so I only know it by the name. And and uh, I, I must admit, that's not what I pictured it looking like. That's amazing. So last year, Nintendo came out with Ring Fit Adventure for you, the other two people on the planet besides me and Brian who mm. weren't up to date on what this was. Um, it's a exercise game and the central part of it is basically it's a Pilates ring, which is the circular ring, which gives you some resistance. You attach one controller to a strap to your leg and you put another controller in this ring here and it can tell when you squeeze it, it can tell its position, etc. There is a game component, which Bryce knows a lot more than I do about that has like 30 or 40 hours of gameplay Mm-hmm. Each day, you can go play a different sort of zone and do different workouts and exercises, try to defeat bad guys, learn new skills and stuff to do this, and it's all physical. Or you can do mini games where you can say, like, oh, I want to work my back or I want to work my deltoids or whatever, and you can play a mini game session for a couple minutes, or you can just do a straight workout, and they have a rhythm game. I I have fun doing stuff like physical things with VR. I get bored very quickly, so I'm like, probably having more things around me would be very cool, so... 
I went and I had a switch that I wasn't using. Said, oh, I bought the switch. Let me hook up the Ring Fit, and I've been having fun with this thing. It's I don't know how long it'll last, but mm -hmm. genuinely fun. It's 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 great, um, and I think part of it is because you have so many different options, right? If you want to do like the RPG game, you can do that, and you can do your exercises as your attacks, and also be thinking about equipment and fighting enemies and and uh, you know. Uh, enemy types and stuff or you know they have a the, the the custom mode where you just set up a little playlist of exercises is really robust and I know over the past year or so they've updated it a lot to let you make more playlists and and uh, that rhythm game is like new Andrew I haven't even played it yet um, it's it, it's really cool and uh, that was the thing that kicked me off into to trying to you know exercise a little bit and stay stay healthy and uh, I'm glad that I'm glad that you tried it and that you love that you're digging it you know what? I'm yeah, actually going to get this as a gift for the family right this minute. <laughs> I think you just <laughs> talked me into it. <laughs> it's, it's, I, I have a newfound respect for running in place. We'll put that, we may put it out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, it's, it's a, I found it very positive in a sense, just like Beat Saber showed you that you could, there is a, you know, you could go into VR and do a physical thing and really enjoy it. Beat, Beat Saber, uh, Please, please, if I could pay five to ten bucks a month for new songs and not have to hack my Beat Saber game, I would love to. Like, that just seems crazy to me. They haven't done that yet. But even Beat Saber gets kind of boring after a while. Like, you know, but variety is great. I love the Ring Fit because I think they nailed it as far as, like, what kind of peripheral do you use to have a little bit more resistance? And... I think I want them to come out with more stuff. Like I was thinking like, man, if they did like a Ring Fit, like Laura Croft adventure or you know, Mario or something... I'd be amazing. That mm. would be amazing. Like I would, you know, I'd be buying new games every few months or so if they come up with that because the physical part, like I don't, you know, to do now to hop up and go do three minutes of jogging and playing a game, think nothing of it. Oh, sounds fun. I'll do that right now. Yeah. Well, and not right now, but <laughs> and on top yeah. of that, it's it's really well made, right? Like I love the music. The music's like really, really good. It the, the visuals and they, you know, all of the enemies are like different pieces of gym equipment. And so you're fighting little yoga mats and and kettlebells and stuff. Mm. Uh, I, it's just it's real it's really solid. I want to play it right now because I'm talking about it like oh I want to go play now I got to go out <laughs> and play. That's how I could think if I, I I'm hopeful I hope like Sony and Xbox and other places pick up on this and sort of emulate this because I think they cracked it. I think mm. this is really a cool entry point into fun sort of pick up really physical games that you feel like you're happy to play a couple times a day. Yeah. Uh, Justin, you got a pick? Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll follow up on the, uh, you know, gift thing. So I was going through some of my uh, uh, Christmas shopping and there was somebody that, uh, you know, doesn't, uh, is, is living alone throughout all this pandemic stuff and i was just trying to think of like eh, what am i gonna get them and uh i went with a uh a site called FrameBridge, which is an app it's a website it's a really easy way that you can upload right from your phone a a picture and it frames up really nice we actually have them here uh in our in our apartment but in in thinking, I know for for many folks that are trying to figure out like ah what am I what am I going to get for for a certain person? I kind of feel like in this, uh in in this year where um you know we spend a lot of time away from each other, uh a a fun memory framed well is uh is something that I'm 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 excited to have sent to uh to to a friend of mine. So, uh, uh that that'll be my pick. Nice, nice. Um, I'm gonna uh, 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 I'll double down on a on a pick I made uh, probably a few weeks ago when we started watching it. But uh, I'm uh, we're we're what four or five maybe six episodes into Hannibal now, and and I'm still on board. I'm I'm still digging it. It's it it keeps it, it. I'm getting a little bit of whiplash right from the idea of like oh, uh, initially I thought oh maybe this is gonna be like a a monster of the week sort of story and and every week it'll be a new uh crime scene and then. The, the first like three episodes are about pretty much the same crime. So you think, oh, so we're really going to go deep into this. And now at about where we are in spoiler in time, it's definitely just gone back to being <laughs> monster of the week. And it's, it's, I, I don't know. It's, it's an interesting uh, sense of its own manipulation um, of, of the audience expectations. 
No, uh, I'm liking I'm liking Hannibal a lot. Cool. All right. Well, um, I think that'll do it here for us for weird things. Everybody, thank you for joining us. Uh, it's been weird. You. Yeah. Hey, look at that. Yeah, good job, Bryce. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. I mean, that was good. That I was really I good. I wouldn't let you into the Intergalactic Federation or nothing, <laughs> but you know. And, and thank you to An Andrew who who picked out who picked out those new stories. It was very helpful. Not not all of them, Bryce. Uh, not not all of them, but uh, yeah. Um, okay, so we've got um, after things come up here in just a second. We've got oh, you know, what? I can send this over to you andrew but we got a good uh email that we can respond to about... oh no he who does weird things says after things okay. <laughs> perfect <laughs> uh, uh, right next Let's to see whoever you smelt you, it, it. Let's see. <laughs> <laughs> all right well uh we'll, we'll take a short break here and come back with after things i'm gonna go drop this off over at the office be sure. right back totally. is that a euphemism yeah he's uh, he's got to go drop the kids <laughs> off at the pool. at the office, I have to go drop the office, drop the folders off at the filing cabinet. Uh, but yeah, if you guys need to, uh, uh, if you need to go take a break, update your drinks, all that stuff, yeah. please, uh, go do it now. You can do it now. Bup, 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 bup. Uh, no, I'm pretty good. I'm good. Okay. Uh, yeah, I had to take a, a, a call because the, um, uh, uh, the, uh, what's it called? The president Amazon, has been. Amazon delivering uh, Amazon things. Gotcha. Uh, we got a new, th we got a new thing at, at my apartment complex cause they don't want to take packages anymore. Yeah. Uh, the office doesn't. And so, um, they have this thing fetch um oh this is oh i thought this was new it was this thing i was gonna mention oh okay interesting um and so their whole deal is like send your packages to this address and we're a business address so we'll get packages early in the morning and then you use our app and we'll give you you can set a two-hour window and we'll bring it to your door um, that's pretty cool it's it's neat and it does end up being about it, it 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 you know things don't end up getting arriving as a any later than say like if USPS was was arriving, yeah. Um, but it's just weird, and it's I guess the front office pays for it, but I don't know. It's just weird. It's weird. It was a very weird thing of being like having to go to you know, especially like for me. I know when when I order packages, whatever. But having to go to like my family and be like, hey, uh, you need to use it to this new thing, and also they're uh. <laughs> Their transition date to make everybody forced to use it what is um uh December twentieth. <laughs> what? What? I All know. Right. Yeah, that's a little silly. I I, <laughs> so I would goofy. say, um, but it's neat. I guess it it the climate control and it's safe. I we don't have a porch pirate problem here, but it's um I think if you did have that issue, I think that's yeah that's the biggest thing. It's just making sure that especially in you're away from a home. big building. With a lot of people, like even, uh, you know, Ashley accidentally had somebody uh, pick up a package that had a bunch of presents in it. Uh, uh, and then all of a sudden, two days later, after she's like trying to figure out everything, just an opened box just was just in front of our door. Mm. <laughs> so somebody was just like, oh, God, this is definitely not for me. Um, there was once a in our building a julia yang who was in uh a, a a similar apartment number mm -hmm. to uh to me and there was more than once that i just picked up julia yang's uh packages because in that initial character recognition moment where i was just like leaning down to look at what was uh, in the lobby i was just like oh yep okay cool and then i i only once opened it up to see a bunch of ladies shoes and be like ah oh, all right finally they're here just throw this at, the, at somebody else i feel so ashamed that i just opened somebody else's mail oh that's the that, worst that they... was the feeling i was trying to describe when i talked about the time that my key worked on another jeep grand cherokee and it wasn't yes. until it didn't start that i realized 
I just unlocked someone else's car and got in. <laughs> <laughs> Oopsie days and drove it. And, <laughs> Luckily uh, it did not start, but but that was a weird moment. We in our complex they had they added one of those Amazon lockers, but it went from some people they would sometimes deliver to front office or they would sometimes deliver right to your door. And then Amazon said in this locker, all the packages will go there. And I had several lengthy, long conversations with Amazon because I said, no, I want them delivered to my door and you can opt for that. And they kept shitting the, sending them to the locker. Mm. And I'm like, if it goes to the locker, I can I mark that as undelivered. And I told the front, I went to Amazon, was taken off this list, but sometimes they would get people delivery, new delivery people who'd be like, eh, just put it in the locker. And I kept telling Amazon every time it happened, no, this is, I'm marking this as undelivered. About uh, a couple of months ago, the front office called and they said, we got about like 12, because they say, oh, like it's there for a week and it gets sent back to Amazon. That never happened. I got a call from their office like, yeah, we found like 12 packages to you <laughs> sitting in the <laughs> no, locker. Jesus. Oh, my God. Like, like, well, they're not mine. You know, those are. Oh, you didn't even just lost. take them. No, I didn't. Because I, I, Amazon sent me replacements and because I was, you know. Ah. I'm adamant, like Costco, because they have this. They have this, the locker, and it's in the it's in the area of Burbank that has the highest number of car break-ins. When they first put it in, there was no lighting there, mm. and it's like I'm not going to send my girlfriend there at night to go there to go pick up packages. And it's just, it was just a ridiculous sort of thing. Like I, I like I like the idea of not leaving my house. I, I want I signed up for that. Mm. Oh, so this wasn't at like your apartment complex. It was just nearby, half a block away. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah, I I can understand that. To, to a degree. That's why I liked Amazon was it's at your door. I, yeah. I live across the street from a shopping plaza. I could just go there and buy stuff. I mean, it's like, uh, yeah, I get it. Amazon. It'd be real convenient if you didn't have to deliver to my door. You know, it'd be, I bet would be even more convenient for you is if I came to you to get everything. And in fact, <laughs> it'd probably be even more convenient if I walked up and down your stupid aisles and picked everything out myself <laughs> and then rang out a checkout. I'm sure that would be easier for you. And then I just do that for all of your other customers. <laughs> we, uh, we, yeah, mm -hmm. right. I'm sure that'd well, be like, we, we don't doubt this is better for you. <laughs> We have an Amazon Fresh that just opened up. <laughs> so Oh, interesting. They're trying. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you guys want to do some after things? Yep. Yes. Let's do it. All right, here we go. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back to the After Things Podcast. I'm Bryce Castillo, joined, as always, with Brian Brushwood. Yo. Justin Robert Young. Yeah. And Andrew Main. Hello there. This is the podcast all about being a creative professional and navigating these crazy content waters. They're so crazy. We got an email from uh, listener Ken who uh, uh, asks about um, podcasting. So um, I'll read out Ken's letter here. Ken writes, I enjoy podcasting. I've made a few different types now and dream of earning a livable income as a podcaster. I know that's a lofty goal. That said, I've yet to earn a dime from a professionally, a personally produced podcast, but I haven't been asking or seeking advertisers. I've been thinking a lot about effort versus frequency in relation to podcasting. Uh, he lists here um, high effort, low frequency shows like Raise the Dead, Justin's, uh, Justin's show, Hardcore History or Heavyweights. Um, the perceived pros that Ken sees is that these tend to be his favorites. Uh, new episodes feel like Christmas morning. There's a re-listenability aspect to them. The listener is more likely to go back and listen to previous episodes as well as share ability. Uh, but perceived cons include, I suspect, a Patreon model re rewards frequency rather than uh, you know, high uh, depth, lower, fewer posts in depth. Uh, it has less discoverability and higher expectations uh, versus the high frequency, less effort shows like uh, politics, 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 let's talk about Star Wars or the morning stream, where those might be uh, have a stronger relationship between the listener and the podcaster. They may be more current, more current events related. Uh, there are lower stakes because there are so many more episodes as well as more chances to, quote, stack that cheddar. Uh, but in terms of cons, that might lead to listener burnout, difficulty standing out, and uh, weaker sauce. I guess maybe that's... Um, uh, uh, it's a scientific term. Uh, for, just you trying have, to you formulate have in the federation to <laughs> use it. Mm -hmm. Ken continues. Of course, you can find a balance between the two, but uh, and put the effort where it counts. Be charismatic and knowledgeable enough that you can riff on a subject and still be captivating. How close? Ken asks. Is my perception to reality? As a rando with tens of listeners, would you lean more to one or the other side of the spectrum there, uh, or would that depend on my own personal strengths? Is the whole idea of the spectrum misguided? Uh, there, we'll get to some of his other questions here after we 
after we get to those. But uh, how, how do you guys feel about Ken's assessment of 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 podcasts as they relate to time and effort? Um, congrats, Ken. You've discovered something very true. And like all true things, it sounds obvious when you say it out loud. You're asking the question of quantity versus quality. And the answer is yes. Uh, uh, does it matter which one you organically gravitate towards? Yeah. Uh, uh, if one of them is easier than the other, uh, then yeah. Can you enjoy success with both strategies? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> is that a decision you have to make? Yes. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and so unfortunately, I'm, 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 it's, uh, uh, I, and, and I do mean this when I say congrats, because like uh, it took me 10 years of content creation before I even had the story attention sales circle in my mind, which now that I say it, it sounds like the most dumbest obvious thing on the planet, but yeah, your job is to be a farmer of ideas. You plant seeds in, in the form of stories that be that, that become beautiful gardens in the minds of other people. And then you, uh, uh harvest with action or sales. Mm -hmm. Uh, just, I, yeah. Well, yeah, I would say that, I, everything Brian said, obviously, I mean, obviously, but I mean, yeah, <laughs> I, the thing to think about is whatever you do, your relationship to your fans is the critical factor. And, 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 and particularly if you're doing indie stuff, I don't have whatever DNA that Brian, Bryce and Justin have that allows them to get onto a microphone every day and talk to people. I do not have that. I don't have that ability. Um, I've tried and I just can't, I, it's not me. I have trained myself to sit down and spend several weeks writing a book and putting a lot of effort into it. And I built up fans that way. There are people that look forward to an Andrew Main book every, you know, you know, twice a year. And you can do, you know, you might say, hey, I wanna do podcast or something like Contap, but maybe your, your market's gonna be Gumroad. You know, maybe it's gonna be some other place. And to Brian's points, like figure out what you, how do you want to spend your life? How do you want to spend your time? If you want to say do frequency, then are you willing to spend the next two years making virtually nothing, spending a couple hours a day doing that? That's the road. That's what it takes. Mm -hmm. But if you do that and you can build fans, there needs to be fans of the, the, the factor that matters for the most. Justin has his show. Justin has for the amount of, Justin, his audience isn't, let's say, as big as, let's say, Modern Rogue, but Justin's audience intensity for what jo Justin does is really huge. And so Justin's able to get people to support and when he does these things. Brian is really good at using these mass medium and YouTube and stuff to be able to do this and also creating funnels, you know, both from people watching the show and scam stuff, et cetera. By the way, about Labyrinth. Um, oh, I'm so excited about it. <laughs> Yeah. And so there are different, it all comes down to, you know, do you want some hard, small, hardcore fans that are going to support you? A large group of fans, either way, that relationship in the product mm -hmm. and what you have energy for. Yeah. And I'm sorry for tearing paper on on Mike. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Justin, one of, one of Ken's questions here is directed to you. If Justin were to wake up and the last 10 years had been a dream, which would he focus on first? Raise the dead, politics, 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 both a hybrid? Uh. I mean, I suspect I'd do what I'm doing now, which is too much and everything and, <laughs> you know, just keep going. But if, if, if it were all a dream, then I would focus on the part of the dream that provided the income. And, and that is P PX3, you know, uh, PX3 drives the bus financially for me. There are other things that I can tape together and, and, and make X amount of a living on and, uh, I, I love focusing on, on all those things, but by and large right now, I have yet to really turn the key on any of the long form stuff, uh, money wise. Now, maybe at some point I do, you know, uh, uh following in, uh, uh, Brian Brushwood's the, the, in, in, in the Brushwoodian model of, uh, uh, you know, the uh, attention or a story attention sales you know when when the time is right for that it will be right but i i would say right now i'll echo again what brian said at the beginning like uh, and what andrew uh, relayed his own experience on you are effectively asking us hey i'm interested in dancing should I break dance or should I waltz? <laughs> Here are the pros and cons of 
the things that uh, uh, I would do and what I would focus on and how I, I would be expected to perform. The only thing you can do is silence. These are good thoughts to have. And when you are further down the road, you are going to be thankful that you had these thoughts early on because you're going to be able to clarify things. But man, at this point, the only thing you need to do is just create, 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 uh, taste failure, understand what it means, uh, and, and build that nucleus of 10, 100 people that will like, they will be your guides as you continue to grow your art. Mm -hmm. I'll give you a, th a thing to think about. Like two of my favorite YouTube channels are very different in what they do. One is Scott Manley, who uh, astronomer actually works for Apple now. He does space news, right? Every not necessarily every day, but sometimes every other day, whatever. And then if there's some big news, space news, he goes and does these ten minute videos, talks about it. His breakdowns are great. He's super knowledgeable. Anything happens in space, whether it's SpaceX or this Japanese mission, which just returned particles from an asteroid, you know, to earth, he can talk about it, talk about it intelligently. And he's great. And I like to, I, every day I go check, is there a new Scott Manley video? And finally one day I said, you know, he never really pushes his Patreon. I, I want to support this guy. Cause I really like what he does. He's every day. He's high frequency. Defunct land, which does these amazing documentaries about Disneyland and television shows and stuff by Kevin Perger. Those come out every couple of weeks. And they're amazing. And I support that too. And so both of them get money from me. One's high frequency. The other is these long thought out documentaries. And there's no right answer. You know, Scott Manley maybe could do these longer form space ones, but I think it would be a different product than what he's doing. And he, he likes to talk about what's on the news going on in space. So his ideal product for him is to do that. And I would say for Ken, it's like, what do you want to do? Like, what, what do you... Are you excited about the idea of something new or something relating to your topic and talking to people about it that day? Or do you want to take your time to make something a little more polished, whatever? Because all those things work. So uh, I think an equally important question that I hear posed less, less often is not only what do you have to offer and what do you want to do? Yes, those are fundamental and foundational, but also what does the universe need that you are qualified to give the universe? Like what is the unmet need of the universe that you could show up and provide? And in terms of, you know, time traveling back to 10 years ago, what would we do different? Understand, uh, yeah, I, I, I don't think it's any, uh, no false modesty here. Uh, all three of us have, have had some scratch off lottery tickets that have paid off very well. But w I think all three of us uh, didn't know which, you know, like uh, you appear to have won at a scratch off lottery ticket. How would you pick your lottery ticket? And the answer is you don't. You, you, you scratch all of them. And then the ones that win are the ones you keep on uh, doing. And you figure out what's inside you and, and it ends up on the outside. And so in that regard, I don't know, podcasting and daily posts or scripting or writing novels, those are all muscles that you develop over time. And you, if we all teleported back to 10 years ago, then we would also be teleporting back to when we had weak bodies and didn't know the structure of podcasting versus the structure of a live stream versus the structure of being able to speak extemporaneously alone on a one mic show. And those are muscles that we wouldn't have and would have to develop all over again. Imagine yeah. going to high school with a kid that said, you yeah, know, I just want to play video games and have people watch me and make money <laughs> like competition. No, nah, just do what I do. Sit on the couch, talk about it. Like I do my friends. I want people, I want you know, I'd be like, that's the, no, I'm sorry. You're going to fail. And you know, yeah. <laughs> most did. Some are millionaires now. And so it's and hard some, to know. Yeah. And yeah, well, but, as but far even as what then, the universe wants. Sorry, go ahead, Andrew. No, no, please, please. Uh, uh, no, I mean, I, I, I would say the one thing that even in that scenario you realize is that the internet's currency is effort. And there is different ways that you can demonstrate effort. The idea that uh, uh, a, a show is produced Part of, I think, like my appeal is that people know that I'm kind of a one man band. And so when there are four podcasts a week for the for, for, for PX3 and then also other you know projects that that may or may not be in the offing over the next few months, the idea is like, oh, OK, well, that's effort. People can smell effort. 
whether or not they are new or old, the idea that this is a one man thing kind of comes through. That's part of the story. That's part of what is important. If you are a larger group, then the effort needs to show up on, on one way or another. If you're doing a long form thing, then man, you better be reviewing it and reviewing it and reviewing it and making sure that every little moment in your head when you're like, yeah, that's probably fine. You think about it again and see whether or not you want to refine that edge because that is it. The only thing that I think that is true on, on day one as it is true at, at whatever level uh, uh, later in, in your journey is can my audience this internet-based audience in a world of infinite content smell my effort on each and everything that I put out. And and I would say, especially if you are still relatively early in Can, like my my advice if you uh uh I, my advice if you are uh very you know if you've got the skills and you've got the experience and you've got a little bit of of built in audiences, you know, look at the type of content that you want to make and what, what format fits best with that. But if you're still relatively early or if you're still building, trying to build up your audience, um, I, I would say you can even abstract that a little bit more of like, just which type of workflow are you more interested? In? Do you want to be, you know, someone who does kind of live to tape, very regular, uh, you know, high frequency shows? Do, do you want to be someone who's doing a lot of scripting and writing and researching and doing stuff uh, at a lower at a uh, you know at a lower frequency and then and then like don't do whatever the next thing you do is don't do the thing that you are really dying to get out there you know keep f find other projects to do in that space so that you are you know continuing to build up that expertise and uh, uh, some of that uh, I, I don't know just just get get some flight time with with that type of work um, because they, because I think I think you are right, Ken, in terms of that spectrum between podcasts and you kind of if you're still so early on like you are, I think you need to figure out which one you would like to be, which person you want to be at the end of that, um, and then as you build up and build up and build up, then you know then you can do the thing that you've been. You know, uh, I, I oh man, I've just been dreaming of this. Now I can finally do the story or the the yeah. type of show, and and not get too caught up right now in those fundamental questions with an idea that you love. Really, right. just come up with ideas, pitch something, do it, and 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 keep trying. Think think of how many Hollywood types are twenty years into their career, and then the news item is I finally get to do this thing that I want. Mm -hmm. Notice they didn't all start with that. They all started serving, you know, what Hollywood needed. You know, they, they show up, oh, you need somebody to play a busboy? Okay, great. In the meanwhile, I'll actually be a busboy so I can keep the lights on. Sure. Yeah. And and that's that's applicable even if you are self-serving your entire thing. If you are, you know, independent on all of your projects of, you know, then you're just serving the podcast community at large because there is a hunger for podcasts. Um, so... Um, I, I also wanted to share um, a little thing here on After Things that someone in our Discord had posted that I did not, I was not aware of. So we've talked about Substack uh, quite a lot here. Um, mm -hmm. That's the uh, newsletter uh, service. You know, you sign up and people can pay you or you can have a free tier of newsletters. Um, what I, I found out is that a Substack has support for podcasting. Um, so you can just make a podcast on Substack. You can upload audio and all show notes and stuff and it even works with um with their subscription stuff so you can have free episodes you can have paid episodes and my understanding is it kind of works a lot like patreon does and that you get a uh, uh you know your your subscribers get a uh, uh a feed uh that is dedicated to them and th this just blew my mind i thought this was like big news today apparently they've had this since 2019 are you able to pay for an entire year all at once you can Ooh. oh oh can you yeah I, I know that pa patreon just added that this year um only on monthly things oh for weekly things that makes sense yeah that makes sense so they they yeah they will get you for the whole thing but you can't a lot of things that Patreon, I really wish sure. a lot more time thinking about instead of picking fights. With <laughs> but, but you look at Substack and Substack doesn't let you pay per email. 
at all. They let you pay per month or per um per or post? per year. But no. but not per post. Not, not per post. Per not post. per post. Yeah. yeah. Um but I just thought that was really interesting because kind of with one fell swoop, I mean I think about you know, we use Patreon for a lot of our podcasts and stuff. And yeah, I think about like the big draws of that are you get an email when a podcast comes out and you're mm-hmm. able to gate stuff between free and premium tiers. And now Substack has that too. And they just take 10%. Ooh. Mm. Now I, I will say having used Substack for, uh, I guess like a month or so now, mm. um, it's for writers Yes. I don't know how much they're going to put time and effort into their podcasting stuff. Um, I, I would, I, I mean, look, uh, and and this is something that like I thought about to today because open Bayou threw it in, into my mentions on Twitter, but it's like, well, you know, I'm, I'm always here for making things available in different places. I would say that uh, for the the politics podcast, which is by far the biggest Patreon thing, um, people have asked to pay, you know, uh, up front for a year. I, I would like the ability to just, you know, whitelist them on a thing where they could just get my my content, uh, uh, you know, outside of Patreon or get an RSS feed that. I think that's that might be some of the I don't know. I I the one thing I worry about with Substack is as they have now become this player in newsletter stuff like whether or not some of they these focus features on sort of fall to the wayside and when I'm charging people for a year ahead of time, man do I got to be sure that at least for a year if not I mean at, at this point like now I could conceivably face a situation where some, where they're just like, Hey, sorry. turns out, uh, uh, doing a newsletter thing at a fraction of the price of MailChimp, uh, uh, really not at all. We're, we're just, we're making it free for use and th- hoping that we get this 10%. turns out that's where we want to put our effort. And we actually don't want to host any podcast because that's its own, um, that's its own cost, so we're just going to drop this feature. And let's Man, like, how does Substack make sure that everything shows up in your real inbox in a way that uh, it doesn't? Mail- okay, it doesn't. Okay. I mean, presumably well, that answers the question. I mean, presumably yeah. you sign up for it and you click on it in your inbox, and that right, and, your and you add it as a you know contact or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I mean, it's 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 still, you know, like my open rates are down compared to Mailchimp when I was sending out the new the, the the daily newsletter on on mailchimp that being said i've had like two or three people that are just super fans that are like yeah despite the fact that i'm not even putting any gate kept content on my Substack, just seeing a button saying give me money just gave me money so yeah. it's like all right i'm already in the black on on the Substack versus mailchimp thing because mailchimp by and large is for selling stuff like and and they and they are they they charge you like a platform that is there for selling stuff. The, all their tools are effectively there to make big, beautiful emails that drives like businesses like uh, uh, scam stuff. Not really for writing a daily yeah. email, right? Uh, but I wanted to share that because I think that's that's interesting, and I think it is. You know, I, it, suddenly it made me go like, oh, so Substack basically is ninety nine percent of what you would use patreon for i mean uh yeah i don't know it's yeah it's it's, it's a- uh, you know what that's my pick too <laughs> justin is it your pick i love it hey it'll be my pick too what about what about you andrew <laughs> so all, right. Oh, all, right. <laughs> all right well that'll do it for after things today andrew uh had to hop off to a, a business and very important business meeting uh but for andrew i don't want to say it has to do with a certain intergalactic federation but mm, i won't deny it <laughs> no uh but for andrew and brian and justin it's been after Cool stuff. Yeah, yeah. Good stuff, everybody. All right. Uh, See you in an hour. Yeah, the guys will be back in an hour for happy One hour. One hour, baby. One hour. All right.
Uh, we got Cord Killers coming up in about three hours. We're going to have Meryl Barr on. Hot men are businessing. <laughs> bye, bye. <laughs> yeah, bye. Uh, Meryl will be on Cord Killers uh, in a little bit. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you. Bye. See ya.